Well, welcome, church history friends. My name is Barb Walden, and it is a joy to welcome you to the third program in the 2021 Church History Without Boundaries lecture series. Uh, we welcome our global storytellers and listeners from all around the world, and thank you all for joining us today. Joining me are two wonderful co-hosts, Joey Williams and Wendy Eaton. Joey serves as the Mission Center President for the Eastern and Western Europe Mission Centers. You may also know him from his many, many years of service in a variety of roles all over the world for Community of Christ. Welcome, Joey. Wendy's here behind the scenes answering questions, dropping information in the chat, and solving mysteries behind the scenes. Wendy also serves as the Administrative Assistant for the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation and the John Whitmer Histor or I'm sorry, the Joseph Smith Historic Site. It's good to have you here, Wendy, if anything, for uh, correcting my, my faux pas. Well, today's program is being recorded for those who are unable to see it live. We will record all of our online programs throughout this series, and you can locate those videos on our YouTube channel as well as our website. Wendy will drop the online lectures link in the chat for you if you're interested in viewing our collection of lectures or interested in going back to see a lecture you may have heard while it was live. Our online lectures would not be possible without generous donors like our friends in the audience. You are literally helping us to preserve and share church heritage through your generosity. Today, uh, donations received through the Church History Without Boundaries lecture series will go to preserve and maintaining Community of Christ historic sites. They'll go to developing new educational programs. Uh, they'll help fund young adults in the Alma Blair internship program and so much more. The online donation link and the mailing address will appear in the chats. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah. And that's it for announcements. I'll turn things over to Joey, our host, to begin today's program. Well, thanks, Barb. Today, we will be talking about the story behind Community of Christ in France. And we have a great guest to share this story, the award-winning historian, Cristal Vanel. I first met Cristal at a youth and young adult winter camp in Germany in 2006. Before the camp, he contacted me and asked if he could come and do some research. And I said, Sure, as long as you fully participate in all of the camp activities. And to my surprise, he did. And it didn't take long for me to see that Cristal truly loves a good story, that he uses an interactive research style with a willingness to just dive in and join in with almost any group to find the stories that are hidden away. And that while he is quite serious about his research, he also brings a great deal of humor and laughter into all of his interactions with others. He's also a lover of foods, especially local dishes, be it in Shima, which is this soft edible dough made of corn flour in Zambia or Kenya, poisson cru, which is raw fish in Tahiti, or a good old greasy American hamburger. Cristal's article, History of the RLDS Church, Community of Christ in France, received the 2011 John Whitmer Historical Association's Best Article of the Year Award. Cristal has a PhD in sociology, a master's in religious studies, and a bachelor's in theology. He has studied Community of Christ history extensively, and it is a pleasure to welcome him as he presents a history of the RLDS Church Community of Christ in continental France. So, bienvenue, Cristal. I'll now turn things over to you as we are all eager to hear your story of Community of Christ in France. Cristal. Okay, thank you. Uh, bonjour. And uh, uh, first of all, um, uh, thank you, Barbara, for uh, the organization. Uh, thank you, Wendy, for uh, the, uh, the assistance, and uh, thank you, uh, Joey, uh, for the introduction. Uh, you're right about, uh, about me uh, being a lover of food, uh, but you forgot to mention that uh, I also love to eat uh, horse meat, uh, because we uh, do eat uh, horse, meat, uh, horse meat in France, uh, so this is something I, I do love to eat. 
Um, anyway, uh, so um, uh, the, the, the presentation today is about the, the history uh, of uh, uh, the RLDS Church and uh, Community of Christ in continental France, and I insist on that. Uh, this is about uh, continental France. That is France, the, the big part of France that is in uh, Western Europe. Um, uh, Community of Christ is, uh, uh, de defines itself as a uh, world uh, denomination and uh, Community of Christ is actually very proud uh, of uh, um, about being a, a world church. And uh, uh, if you attend uh, Community of Christ uh, World Conferences, uh, you can actually uh, meet delegates from uh, all continents. And especially, uh, you can see and you can hear uh, delegates from uh, French Polynesia, from Tahiti. Um, during World Conference, Tahitians, uh, they share dances, uh, they share necklaces, uh, they share uh, songs. Uh, with uh, uh, the Americans and, and with the international uh, audience. Um, and Tahitian members uh, also uh, participate in uh, the, uh, the, uh, the flag ceremony. So I, I don't know if we can um, uh, show the slide uh, number two. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Wendy. Um, the, thi the, the, the thing is that uh, uh, a French man or French woman uh, who is very nationalistic uh, could uh, argue that there is no need for uh, uh, a Tahitian flag during the flag ceremony because actually French Polynesia uh, is uh, part of, uh, of France. Um, French Polynesia actually is uh, an overseas country, so it is uh, somewhat, part, uh, somewhat part of uh, the French Republic uh, with uh, a semi-autonomous status. And uh, so what uh, we're uh, dealing about today is not the history of the church in French Polynesia. Uh, this has been done before. Uh, there are books, uh, uh, articles, uh, stories about that very specific history of uh, the RLDS and the Community of Christ in French Polynesia. But today we are focusing on the uh, Community of Christ and the RLDS Church in uh, continental France. Uh, I don't know if we can show uh, uh, next slide, slide number three. Uh, so um, French Polynesia has, has its own uh, unique identity, even though it is part of France. Um, and part of uh, the uh, unique identity of French Polynesia is uh, religious pluralism. Uh, in French Polynesia, you have uh, many churches, many denominations. Uh, Protestantism is the majority religion, 54% uh, of the population. Then it is followed uh, by uh, Roman Catholics, 34%. Uh, then Latter-day Saints or Mormons. 10% uh, and then uh, Community of Christ, uh, 3%. Uh, Community of Christ is present in French Polynesia since the, uh, the 1870s. And it is also known as uh, the uh, Sanitos Church and its members as Sanitos. Today, um, even though um, there is not yet a, a, a Tahitian Community of Christ uh, theology, uh, because uh, Tahitian members get uh, their theology from uh, the headquarters in Independence, Missouri. Uh, even though there is not yet uh, a specific Tahitian theology in the Community of Christ, still there is uh, one uh, Tahitian apostle, uh, Mare Varno. Uh, and uh, Community of Christ is present in Tahiti since the uh, 1870s, but it's also present in continental France uh, since the second part of the 20th uh, century. Um, so uh, Community of Christ uh, <clears throat> is very strong, is somewhat strong in French Polynesia, uh, 8,000 members, 3% uh, of the population, 
Uh, in France, it's, I will say, less than 100 members. It was uh, 75 members in uh, 2009. And most of those are uh, Tahitians, uh, uh, so Sanitos uh, living in uh, continental, continental France. So in France, uh, Community of Christ is actually an, an ultra-religious minority in a secular country with uh, Catholicism as its majority uh, religion, as we can read in slide uh, number four. Um, <clears throat> in France, uh, most of the population is uh, Roman Catholic, but also most of the population doesn't practice Roman Catholicism. Uh, between 2% and 4% of the population in France uh, actually uh, practices um, Catholicism. You have also um, Islam, which is uh, the second largest religion in France, maybe 8% of the population. And you have uh, Protestantism uh, between 2 and 4% of the population. And most of the Protestants today, uh, I will say, are evangelical uh, Protestants. Uh, but even though Community of Christ is an ultra-religious minority in France, uh, still Community of Christ is there uh, since, uh, the second war, uh, since uh, the second part of the uh, 20th uh, century. And Community of Christ uh, has its own unique history in France uh, with uh, unique personalities such as uh, Jean Buissou and uh, Thierry Schmitt. Uh, both of them uh, were full-time ministers for Community of Christ uh, in France. So uh, what I will do, uh, so uh, slide uh, number five, uh, I, I will uh, first uh, tackle uh, the beginnings of the uh, reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in uh, continental France, uh, uh, among Mormons and among American RLDS servicemen. Then um, we will uh, look at the history of the uh, RLDS Church under the ministry of uh, Jean-Christophe Buissou, uh, who is uh, an important man in the history of the uh, RLDS Church in France, but also somewhat in the uh, RLDS Church in, uh, in the French-speaking world. Um, and uh, third, uh, we will uh, finally look at the history of Community of Christ in France uh, under the leadership uh, and ministry of uh, Thierry Schmitt. Uh, so slide number uh, six. So uh, the beginnings of uh, Community of Christ um, in uh, continental France uh, among the French Mormons. So 1960s uh, were actually the beginnings of uh, the RLDS uh, presence in France uh, in the southern part uh, of the country. And this began with a man uh, named uh, George uh, Ventura. So George Ventura uh, used to be a Mormon. He used to be a, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, headquartered in, uh, in Salt Lake City. Um, and he, he, was also, he, he also used to be a, a full-time uh, missionary uh, for uh, the LDS Church in uh, southern France. Um, Ventura... Um, at the time when he, when he met uh, the uh, RLDS church, he was actually studying at the University of uh, Barcelona in, uh, in Spain. And uh, in uh, November, uh, uh, in, in July uh, 14, uh, 1960, um, RLDS apostle Roscoe de Vie and uh, Bishop uh, Anton Compierre uh, met uh, in uh, Calais. And then uh, they, uh, they met with uh, George Ventura and they began to do uh, some uh, RLDS missionary work in, uh, in, uh, in the south of France. And actually what they did is uh, because George Ventura used to be a Mormon missionary in the southern part of France, well, what they did is uh, they went to see um, contacts that uh, Ventura uh, had during his uh, LDS mission in France. And so they uh, did some uh, uh, visiting in uh, Marseille, in Cannes, and in Nice. And um, some uh, Mormon women, uh, one of them was uh, a teacher, uh, were, were uh, interesting, uh, were 
had some interest in uh, the uh, RLDS church and they uh, found a place to, uh, to meet for um, Sunday services. So most of the people who had interest uh, in the RLDS church at the time were uh, people uh, who uh, were uh, Mormons. Um, maybe those people um, began to uh, be uh, uh, dissatisfied with the LDS church uh, because at the time uh, the uh, LDS church in France uh, was uh, going through some uh, hard times. Um, in 1858, nine missionaries uh, serving uh, as missionaries for the LDS church in France were excommunicated because they uh, promoted the doctrine of polygamy. And actually they joined uh, one of the uh, polygamy cult uh, in America. So maybe that's why uh, the uh, our LDS church uh, found some success uh, in the southern part of France uh, among French Mormon. Later on, um, the RLDS church uh, also found some success in France uh, among uh, US soldiers. So that is slide uh, number seven. So in 1961, um, at the home of uh, Ray Peeth uh, in Fontainebleau, which is a, a city not far away from, uh, from France, uh, the first baptism uh, in France uh, took place. The new baptized member was uh, actually the oldest daughter of brother and sister Peeth, and the baptism was performed by Kenneth Powers, a first lieutenant in the US Armed Forces and a priest in the RLDS Church. The baptism was followed by three baby blessings and two of the babies were blessed um, uh, and, 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 and no, and uh, two, two, uh, sorry, two of the babies uh, blessed were those of a French Tahitian uh, couple. Uh, so the couple uh, was uh, Jean Jacques, uh, who was married to uh, Maï Inari. So I'm very sorry if my Tahitian accent is bad. I only speak a little bit of English and French. Um, and so uh, Mahi Ina Ari was a member of the RLDS church and her husband uh, was uh, just a Frenchman who happened to marry uh, a Tahitian woman. The news around the world uh, section uh, of the uh, January uh, uh, 16th, 1966 since Herald mentions uh, the existence of an RLDS congregation meeting in the French city of Verdun. Uh, the article reads that most of the members there at present come from the United States or Canada and are attached to the armed forces of those countries. The pastor then was Jerry Pratt, stationed in Laon, France. And as Verdun is known, is known in France and Western Europe as the scene of a crucial and bloody war and, and a bloody World War I battle, Captain Von McLaughlin. A, me a member of the RLDS congregation in Verdun wrote, the miraculous thing is that from the blood-sucked soil of Verdun has sprung the tender roots and leaves of the gospel seed. Even though the consistent ministry that he wished may have been present in the Verdun congregation, it seemed it's only focused on RLDS American soldiers. So even though, you know, uh, there were some baptisms uh, of uh, French people. Uh, some of them past Mormons, some of them Tahitians living in France. It seems that at the time, really the uh, our earliest presence in France was uh, among American uh, militaries. That changed uh, with uh, the arrival of uh, Jean-Christophe Buissou. Uh, in uh, continental France. Uh, so this is the, the next slide. So uh, Jean Buissou uh, was actually a convert uh, to a community of Christ. 
uh, Jean Buissou was raised in Paris. He is, his parents were uh, art teachers. And uh, after the Second World War, uh, Jean Buissou enlisted in the French Navy. Uh, he met his wife, Tateo, in Tahiti while uh, serving, uh, while visiting French Polynesia. And on December the 13th, uh, 1959, Jean and Tateo were married. And the next day, Jean was baptized in the organized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, Alan Tyree, who uh, later became an apostle for the Araldius Church, uh, performed the marriage and the baptism of Jean Buissou, and uh, he wrote about Jean Buissou. Jean Buissou was the first French member of the Tahitian Church who was really taking his baptism seriously. I had high hopes for him and his ministry to which I knew he was called. Buissou then had a unique spiritual experience when he received his patriarchal blessing, uh, now known as uh, the evangelist's blessing from patriarch Louis Ostertag in 1964. Uh, Louis Ostertag uh, actually was born in Eastern France, in Alsace. He immigrated with his family uh, to the United States as a child, and later he converted to the Aurelius Church. Uh, Ostertag arrived in Tahiti as a missionary in December 1964, and he was able to give Jean Buissou his patriarchal blessing. Uh, because Ostertag was born in Alsace, Ostertag uh, still uh, spoke French, so he was able to give uh, Jean Buissou a blessing in French. And Jean Buissou recalled later about his patriarchal blessing. In the middle of the prayer, I heard these words, and they changed my life forever. You are, a precious, uh, you are precious to your father in heaven. You are precious in his own eyes. In an instant, I was given self-worth and self-respect. Divine love flooded my entire being. Relationships with myself, others, and God were reestablished. I felt the power of salvation. God's presence in my life had become a living reality, not an intellectual understanding. Since then, my existence has taken an upward turn. So we can see that uh, his patriarchal blessing was a unique spiritual experience uh, for Jean Buissou. And indeed, uh, Buissou became a full-time minister two years after he received his uh, patriarchal blessing. He underwent uh, some ministry uh, training at the School of the Restoration in Independence, Missouri. And then he was assigned to Tahiti, uh, where he had the opportunity to establish a school for children with special needs. Uh, in the early 1970s, uh, people from France uh, were having some uh, interest in the RLDS church, and so the church contacted Jean Buissou. Uh, so there were uh, the Golan family. Uh, so the Golans uh, were a couple living in France. Uh, so the husband uh, was uh, a Frenchman uh, working for an airplane company, and the, the woman was a Tahitian lady. And at the time, they were the only uh, church members uh, living in France. So Buissou will sometime uh, travel from Tahiti to visit France in order to bring ministry and meet people who had interest in the church. Uh, he recalls baptizing a Frenchman named Gérard Gaverio in 1974. And around that time, uh, Buissou also befriended with uh, Natasha Trocmé-Gilman, the uh, adoptive daughter of Protestant minister André Trocmé, uh, who was famous and who still is famous uh, because during the war, uh, he protected Jews uh, during the, the Second World War. Uh, Natasha Trocmé was baptized in the earliest church uh, while living in the USA in the 1970s. In 1976, uh, Jean Buissou was assigned uh, to France as a full-time minister. Jean and his wife Tateo uh, and their four children uh, arrived in France in April uh, 1976 
And uh, when he arrived in France, uh, Jean was shocked uh, by the uh, economic depression that uh, France was experiencing at the time. Uh, and so he wrote to uh, his friend uh, Roy Cheville, who uh, served as uh, the church presiding patriarch, uh, patriarch sorry, from uh, 1958 to 1974. The economic depression has had its effect and you can see those everywhere. There is, there is misery and hardship. The old people need help and many youth are out of work. It takes struggling to be able to barely join the two ends. I think we, as a church, will have to be seen in works of mediating love, which I don't know now, but we should be involved with helping the day-to-day -day hardships of the working families. So um, the, 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 the purpose of the earliest church uh, in France uh, at the time was to bring ministry to Tahitian members living there uh, on the continent. And it was also to establish the earliest church among, uh, among the natives of the land, among the French people. Uh, church meeting were first held every Sunday at Buissou's home in uh, Danemont, a small village uh, near Paris. And uh, Buissou there uh, recalled performing uh, the uh, earliest marriage of Gérard and Daniel Gaverio. On November 19, 1978, the RLDS Church had its first meeting on the third floor library of the American Church with Apostle William T. Higdon as a guest minister for this inaugural service. Uh, so you can see a, a photo of uh, the um, American Church um, in Paris. Um, this is uh, slide uh, number 10. So this is actually the, uh, the uh, Episcopal Church in Paris. Uh, this is uh, a church near uh, the uh, Eiffel Tower. Uh, the uh, rector today is, uh, is a woman. Uh, and this is the, uh, the church for the uh, American diaspora in Paris. Uh, and, this, and so when the earliest church uh, and meetings in the American church, it was in uh, 1978. So someone um, could be surprised uh, that a church uh, whose name was then the reorganized church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was actually able to use uh, an, an Episcopal church for its Sunday services. But actually, one needs to understand that Buissou was uh, educated enough and clever enough uh, to uh, be a friend with uh, the uh, uh, Episcopalian uh, rector. Uh, as a rector, uh, sorry, as a scholar, uh, the um, Episcopal rector was pleased uh, with uh, Buissou's academic training in religion uh, at, uh, because Buissou had uh, recently uh, completed his degree uh, in uh, religion from Park College. And uh, the uh, priest, the Episcopal priest actually knew about Park College. Uh, and also the uh, Episcopal rector knew about the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of uh, Latter-day Saints. He knew a little bit about the history of the uh, RLDS Church. And he uh, perfectly understood that the uh, RLDS Church uh, was not uh, the uh, Mormon Church. <clears throat> and so um, graciously and kindly, he, uh, he led Buissou's congregation uh, use the library of the uh, Episcopal Church for Sunday services. And also the uh, Episcopal Church uh, invited Buissou uh, to be a member of a ministerial alliance in Paris uh, that, that brought together ministers from uh, various denominations in Paris. And so uh, Jean Buissou uh, was also able to uh, uh, become a friend with uh, ministers from uh, uh, Protestant churches and uh, even with a priest uh, from uh, uh, the uh, Roman Catholic Cathedral of uh, Notre Dame. So the, the small RLDS congregation uh, occupied the library of uh, the uh, American church for uh, several months. Uh, but on, on November 
1979, uh, the, uh, the church uh, began to uh, rent space at, uh, uh, in the 16th uh, uh, district of Paris, uh, Rue Boissière. In this new place, uh, the congregation met every Sunday for uh, worship and uh, Buissou gave uh, classes and training on family relationships and uh, communication. Later, um, around, uh, in around um, 1984, the Paris congregation moved to Rue Cédillo in uh, the uh, seventh district of Paris. So the 16th district of Paris and the seventh district of Paris those are actually uh, nice areas. Um, those are the most expensive areas uh, in Paris. Uh, the uh, apartments uh, are, uh, the, the, the prices are, are, are just too much. So even though uh, Jean tried to uh, uh, establish a congregation in France, even though he brought ministry to uh, Tahitians living in France, uh, and even though he also uh, worked uh, on missionary work among French people, uh, proselytism uh, was actually uh, difficult in France. Jean Buissou tried giving leaflets about the church to people um, walking uh, in the subway or to people uh, walking near the Sorbonne University, but he only um, then uh, recalled uh, experiencing uh, mockery and insults. Things got even harder uh, after 19, uh, the, the 1978 collective suicide massacre of the People's Temple community at Gemstone, Guyana. Uh, the media in France uh, began to, to, to talk about the dangers of cults and uh, many French people uh, would have considered uh, the uh, reorganized church as a dangerous American cult. In 1982, uh, Jean Buissou was uh, interviewed um, as the French National Church President by Jean-François Mayer, uh, who is a Swiss scholar um, who has a special interest in uh, new religious movements. Uh, the interview was published in uh, Mouvement Religieux, uh, the bulletin of the Association of Study and Information and Religious Movements. And so uh, Jean-François Mayer, uh, who is a scholar, um, ask uh, questions about, uh, to, to Jean Buissou about the reorganized church and the beliefs and the practices of the uh, reorganized church. Uh, so one question that uh, uh, Mayer asked Buissou was, do you find particular difficulties while preaching the gospel in France? Buissou answered, I feel as we are victims of a false image. One reason for this sad situation is that we are unjustly identified to the Utah, Utah Mormon Church, to its theology and to its history. Nevertheless, an objective observer will find nothing in our theology and much less in our practices that will justify such a prejudice. I hope that as time goes on and with an open, positive and patient attitude from us, will open the doors of understanding and that will finally be accepted as who we truly are. True Christians, not living on the margins of Christianity. In sum, we're a Christian church just as the others. Thus, we can see that uh, one of the main difficulties experienced by Jean Buissou during his ministry in France was the confusion people made between the LDS church and the RLDS church. The desire to be accepted by other Christians was strongly expressed by Buissou during the interview. Another question that uh, Mayer asked uh, Jean Buissou uh, was about the closeness of the reorganized church to mainstream Christianity. Buissou explained that while corruptions were introduced well after Joseph Smith's death in the restoration movement, the church of the 1830s had many similarities 
with Protestantism. And then Mayer asked Buissou a question about uh, ecumenism. Uh, so he asked Mayer if the uh, earliest church was ready or not to participate in the uh, ecumenical movement. And so uh, Jean Buissou uh, answered, uh, next slide. Um, okay, next slide, <laughs> sorry for that. So Jean Buissou answered about the uh, ecumenical movement. Personally, I think I already wrote that the ecumenical movement is one of the great prophetic, prophetic works of our times. The main obstacle to, to our participation in this movement doesn't seem to come from us, but from other Christians who criticize our position on the scriptural canon and the concept of revelation. Nevertheless, concerning fundamental Christian beliefs, as I already told you, we have an orthodox teaching. We believe in the Trinity, the divinity of Jesus Christ, and the authority of the scriptures. Our conception of the fall and salvation of mankind is based on the letter of Paul to the Romans. Our sacraments are similar to those of other churches, and we never practiced any secret or strange rituals. We will have a lot to gain in getting close to other Christians and get away of a ghetto uh, that has no reason to be and that exists only because of narrowness of mind and prejudices that always opposed to progress. On a personal level, I belong to a Parisian ministerial alliance composed of Protestant ministers and Catholic priests. So here we see that once again, Jean Buissou expressed the desire to be recognized as a mainstream Christian and not on the margins of Christianity. The interview was done in 1982, two years after the earliest World Conference adopted a resolution titled Participation in Interdenominational Christian Ministries, which endorsed the participation of the world church in interdenominational ministries where no traditional beliefs or practices needed to be altered or abandoned. The right of each field jurisdiction to determine the nature of its participation and ecumenical involvement by the, by the jurisdiction of the church was encouraged. This resolution provided support for ecumenical involvement by appointees in the field, support that proved valuable for a number of appointee ministers, increased activity by various appointees and leaders of the church followed. And I'm here quoting uh, Dale uh, Luffman, an article uh, from uh, Restoration Studies. So in some ways, Buissou had succeeded in being accepted as a mainstream Christian, or at least by, by mainstream Christians, I, as he was a member of the ministerial islands in Paris. Nevertheless, the success of the uh, our earliest church in Paris and in France at the time uh, were um, um, important, but from a strictly numerical number, uh, they were few. Uh, and so in, 19, uh, in, in the 1980s, uh, community of Christ um, was reborn uh, under the ministry of uh, Thierry Schmitt. So, so before we look at Thierry Schmitt, we, we can see some uh, pictures at, uh, of Jean Buissou. If you look at slide uh, number uh, 13, um, you can see Jean Buissou. So Jean Buissou is uh, then in the middle. Uh, top middle, he has glasses and he has a tie. He has a suit, a tie, and he has, uh, he has got some glasses. Uh, next slide, uh, slide 14. Uh, you can uh, see another picture with uh, Jean Buissou. And uh, this time, uh, Jean Buissou uh, is on uh, the far uh, left uh, with a blue greenish suit. Uh, a black tie and a blue shirt. 
uh, and you can see some uh, members of the congregation and you can see that some of them are Tahitians. So after giving ministry in France, um, Jean Buissou gave ministry to the World Church. Uh, he, uh, he was a teacher and he was a missionary in uh, the, the French speaking world, uh, in, uh, in Africa, in, in Haiti. And he also worked as a translation because he, uh, he, he uh, translated the Doctrine and Covenants. And he also did the translation of the first volume of uh, the church uh, through the years, um, um, a textbook, a church history textbook from uh, Richard uh, Howard. So now we can look at the <clears throat> ministry of Terry Schmidt, uh, slide uh, uh, 15. And first of all, we, we have to understand that Thierry Schmitt, uh, like Jean Buissou, was uh, a convert uh, to uh, the, uh, the um, RLDS church. Uh, Thierry Schmitt uh, arrived in Tahiti as a French military man. And he came to know and uh, felt in love with uh, Amélie, uh, who was uh, uh, a member of the, uh, of the uh, reorganized church. She was a member of uh, what is known there as uh, the uh, Sanito Church. And they were married in uh, 1982. Thierry and his wife uh, returned to France in 1983, uh, just before Jean Buissou left uh, the country. Uh, and so they established themselves uh, near Brest in Brittany. So it's the, in, in the west part of France. And uh, uh, even though uh, Amélie was uh, a member of the organized church, and even though um, Schmidt uh, at the time loved the uh, RLDS church, uh, they were alone by themselves and they didn't have the fellowship of uh, the uh, reorganized church uh, where they were living. Uh, nevertheless, uh, they strive to give a religious education uh, to uh, their uh, children. In 1994, uh, when their children were old enough to receive uh, baptism according to uh, Aralia standards, Thierry and uh, Amélie heard that a uh, um, recognized church minister from French Polynesia was uh, visiting France. And so uh, the Sanito minister visited, uh, visited the, fam uh, the Schmidt family and he taught them about the church. Uh, the children's baptism took place on December 16, 1994 in a swimming pool and more than 40 people attended the events, most of whom were Cherry and Anne-Melie's friend, but none of them were uh, members of the uh, Aralius church. And for the first time, Thierry uh, and, uh, and Amélie uh, realized that uh, French people uh, didn't understand uh, the uh, reorganized church. In March 1995, Apostle Larry Thierry, um, who uh, later on became uh, the head of the translation department in Committee of Christ. So in 1995, uh, Apostle Larry Thierry presiding evangelist Evred Grafeo, uh, who also served as a missionary in French Polynesia. So uh, he spoke French. Uh, and 70, Jerry Van Russen, and 70, uh, Kirstin uh, Jeske, met at uh, Thierry Schmidt house in Brittany. And Schmidt offered to um, organize church meeting in France. And so then he contacted church members and church friends in France. And once again, he, uh, he uh, struggled with uh, misunderstandings. Um, misunderstandings from uh, church members uh, who felt betrayed by the church because uh, Buissou's ministry ended and they, uh, they felt that the church uh, had um, left them, abandoned them, and also, all the church members from Tahiti who uh, didn't understand uh, Cherry Schmidt ministry because Cherry Schmidt was contacting church member. Cherry was trying to organize the church, but Cherry, as, as the time, uh, was not yet uh, a member of the uh, Araldish church. He was not yet baptized.
in uh, the summer of 1995, even though not yet baptized in, uh, in the church, um, Terry Schmidt uh, organized uh, a, a camp. And later on, uh, Terry Schmidt will organize a summer camp. So uh, summer camps, uh, like in the US, like in other countries, uh, summer camp are tradition of the community of Christ and the earliest church, uh, thanks to uh, the, the ministry of, uh, of uh, Terry Schmidt. Uh, during that camp, um, Apostle uh, Larry Terry was there, and uh, Amelie Schmidt, the wife of uh, Terry Schmidt, was ordained to the uh, office of priest. And from this point, Terry Schmidt did further study about the church history, theology, and mission. Uh, he was troubled by the uh, hierarchy of the church, um, and also he was uh, troubled by the Mormon roots of the church. Uh, even though uh, never considered as a cult by French officials, uh, Mormonism was often considered as church uh, by most of the French people. Um, and also, uh, Terry Schmidt had struggled uh, because he was not accepted by uh, Taitian members in France. He wasn't accepted, uh, accepted because he was not Taitian and he was not accepted because he was not a church member. Um, <clears throat> and also his wife, sometimes she had some trouble because some Taitian members living in France uh, didn't accept her ministry, uh, being raised in the church before 1984 and uh, the uh, opening of the priesthood uh, to uh, women. Uh, despite all those difficulties, uh, Schmidt fell closer to the uh, earliest church than he did uh, any other Christian denominations. And finally, finally, in June 1997, Schmidt was baptized in the reorganized church at the 39th Street Church in Independence, Missouri, while participating at an international youth forum held at the church headquarters in uh, Independence, Missouri. Three years after his baptism in 2000, Terry Schmidt became a full-time minister for the uh, reorganized church in uh, continental France. And uh, Terry Schmidt was uh, at a very active ministry. Um, he often visited uh, sick people uh, at hospitals. And, and, and that was an important part of uh, Terry's ministry. Um, France uh, did some nuclear testing on the seashores of French Polynesia. And, and because of the nuclear testing, uh, lots of Tahitian, uh, they uh, have cancer today. And uh, if they want to be treated for cancers, uh, most of them come, uh, go to continental France and um, go to a hospital there. And some of them are uh, members of the uh, Rivenas Church. So part of Terry Schmidt ministry uh, was to bring healing and, and listening to, uh, to those uh, church members uh, from Tahiti uh, being uh, treated for cancer in France. Uh, another part of uh, Schmidt's uh, ministry was to offer the sacraments of uh, Community of Christ to Tahitian members uh, living in France. Uh, he baptized several children, performed marriages, conducted funerals, uh, uh, but his ministry uh, was not based in Paris. Uh, Jean Buissou ministry was um, uh, based in Paris. Cherry Smith ministry was not um, solely focused on Paris. Um, a congregation was actually established in Brest, uh, Brittany, where uh, Thierry Schmidt lived in 2005. Uh, they had uh, sun weekly Sunday worship, they had weekly uh, Bible studies, and, uh, and also uh, Thierry Schmidt was able to uh, establish uh, a small group in Bordeaux, in the southwest of France, uh, where uh, they had some uh, worship uh, and uh, classes and uh, meetings. Schmidt sometimes will visit the capital city of Paris and uh, sometime uh, he will have uh, worship uh, with uh, uh, Taitian people uh, in, uh, in Paris. 
Uh, but to meet also regularly, we uh, did some Tour de France. So uh, he took his car and uh, he did some Tour de France. Uh, he visited cities like uh, Toulouse, Marseille, Montpellier, Toulon, Metz, Lille, Orléans. And so he will uh, visit uh, church members um, and, uh, and, uh, and friends. The 2001 report of the uh, General Assembly of Community of Christ in France shows that 56 members were then living in France. Paris had eight members and 20 members were then living in Brittany. The report also mentioned that the 2000 World Conference had decided to change the church name to Community of Christ effective on April 6, 2001. The report says further that Schmidt registered the name of the church in France as Église de la Comité du Christ, which means Church of the Community of Christ, as the word community alone was not clear in the French context and might sound too cultish. Once a year, Thierry Schmidt organized a family camp. The camp was an opportunity for French members and their friends to meet, play, worship, enjoy classes, and of course, eat, because we're in France. In May 2005, the family camp took place in a campground at Le Tech in uh, uh, a town in the, in, in the French area of uh, Région. And uh, Wim van Klinken, uh, then Europe mission president, was present, as well as uh, Joey Williams, who was then uh, the uh, Europe uh, youth minister. Since 2006, Schmidt has not been employed as a full-time minister, uh, but still he's uh, uh, active as a minister and he serves uh, on a volunteer basis, helping with the uh, organization of yearly camps and administering the sacraments to church members uh, in France. So as a conclusion, we can see that uh, the history of the, uh, our earliest church community of Christ in France reflects the history of the entire denomination. As the world church had an identity crisis in the 1960s and sought to be accepted by mainstream Christianity, so did the church in France under the ministries of Jean Buissou and Thierry Schmitt. Both ministers wanted to make it clear that they were not Mormons. Also, both were Frenchmen from continental France who came to know the earliest church community of Christ through their Tahitian Sanito wives. Buissou and Schmidt were dedicated to their church ideals and had a strong desire to spread it in their native land. Buissou's ministry was the ministry of dialogue and teaching as Buissou received advanced theological training and established contacts among theologians and other intellectuals. Schmidt ministry was a more practical and physical ministry, bringing the sacraments to people all around the country during his ministerial Tour de France. Thank you. Well, a great big merci to you, Cristal, for sharing your research on church history in France. Your talk gave so much context to the stories of the many names that I've heard over and over in my work in Europe, and especially to Jean Buissou, and of course, to Thierry Schmidt as well. We've come to that part of our program where we open up the floor to the audience for any questions that may have surfaced during today's lecture. And so if you go to that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, you can put in any questions that you might have right there. But I'll go to Barb and ask if there are already some questions to get us started off with. We don't have any questions in the queue right now. Folks may be thinking about the question and typing it in. So this gives me a chance to ask Crystal a question. Uh, Crystal, you're um, an expert on Community of Christ history in France. And I imagine as you were knee deep in your research, you ran across a, a lot of information. Uh, but weren't able to get to all of that information. So if there are scholars out there who have been inspired by your lecture and are interested in researching church history in France, what areas would you recommend? Uh, what areas do you wish that you could have covered if you had more time or 
uh, rabbit holes you wish you could have gone down? Uh, I think uh, the uh, early uh, early years among uh, in, in the 1960s, uh, especially among Mormons. Uh, uh, I, I would have loved to find more information about uh, Georges Ventura and, uh, and um, members of the uh, LDS church um, who, um, who, um, who converted to a uh, community of Christ. Well, it sounds like there's still more to explore. Um, we do have a number of questions appearing in the queue and it, a lot of them are related to Community of Christ Today. Um, Joey has offered to field any Community of Christ Today questions that, that Crystal, you uh, don't feel prepared to answer. So feel free mm -hmm. to have Joey answer all of the questions uh, you don't okay. want to answer yourself. So, uh, so do you want me to go through the questions or how does it work? Well, I'll read the questions and okay. then you can let Joey if you'd let let Joey know if you'd like him to answer that question. Okay. Our first question comes from Susan Oxley, and Susan asks, what are Jean and Tatua doing now? How are they? I assume they still live in Tahiti. Uh, so I, I met Jean Buissou uh, twice in Paris, uh, and I had an email exchange with him, but that was, yeah, that was a long time ago. Uh, I only I know through Facebook that uh, Jean Buissou is uh, living well in Tahiti, and uh, also maybe uh, Joey, you have um, uh, news from him because actually the pictures that we saw are from Jean Buissou, and Jean Buissou uh, uh, shared them with uh, with uh, Joey. So maybe Joey, you have some news from uh, from Jean. Yeah, I've spoken to Jean Buissou in just the last couple of weeks when I called to see if he had any pictures that he could offer for this lecture series. And he seems to be doing well and he's taking care of his wife who has had some health uh, difficulties recently. So you might keep her in your thoughts. And, but he's doing, he's doing really well and he was really excited to talk a little bit about his time in France as well as share those pictures that you've seen in today's presentation. Our next question comes from Dorcas Wilkinson, and Dor Dorcas asks, how has Sandy Gamay's presence affected the church in France? This sounds like another uh, Community of Christ Today question. Mm -mm. Joey Williams. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to answer that. It's very interesting because I'm not sure Sandy has had a direct impact on France. However, she has influenced things that are happening in France. So. Two years ago, we brought a World Service Corps volunteer from French Polynesia. His name is Kahelani, and he came to live in Brussels and help with the ministry that we've set up in Brussels, which is mainly working with some Congolese refugees that we call co-citizens. And Sandy has come many times to teach different various classes. And so her influence on that, because Kahelani has now been placed this year in Tours in France, and so he's now living in France and working with what we have going on in France right now. And so a lot of the things that Sandy came and taught about peace and all of the classes that she was able to teach in Brussels, Kahelani is now incorporating in the ministry that he does online and also in person throughout France. So I would say she's had a big influence, but she hasn't directly traveled that much in France or been with many of the members that we have there. We have another question from Susan Oxley and Joey, you may have answered this, but I'll give you a chance to continue if there's more you wish to share. Susan uh, asks, what is happening with the French community of Christ today? Yeah, as Crystal uh, talked about, since Thierry has not been working for Community of Christ. Of course, it's been more difficult with all volunteers to keep activities going, but he was doing that as a volunteer regularly. There were always these camps that we've had every year. And so there have been 
basically a few activities per year that have kept people going. We don't have any physical church buildings in France either. And so that's another way that it's made it very difficult for people to continue to meet. However, about a year before the pandemic began, which is very interesting because we were kind of all set up for the pandemic with Kahelani, we began gathering online with members all throughout France and members and friends of Community of Christ. And so in those very first gatherings, we had anywhere from 70 to 80 people that were gathering. And now we have regularly about 40 or 50 people who gather online each Sunday and various activities throughout the week that Kahialani does. In fact, he's doing one right now. He has every Thursday a This Is Our Story, This Is Our Song, where people, he has a different person that he interviews and talks about their story in Community of Christ. And so that's basically the ministry that's going on right now. There have recently been several calls to priesthood that people have accepted and that were just approved at a, an online meeting that we had for France. And so we're moving forward with kind of some new expressions of what the church might look like in France, as well as in other places in Europe. Well, our next question comes from Michael Ratcliffe. And Michael asks, our LDS missionaries were active in the British Isles in the 1860s and thereafter. Were there no RLDS missionaries in France in the late 1800s, even if unsuccessful in uh, attracting converts? No, uh, it's, it's, it's a great question, but uh, as far as I know, no. Um, in a, and, and also maybe because of the language barrier. Uh, it's, it's also maybe because of that, because in France, um, people speak French, obviously, and uh, our LDS missionaries came from America. So in the uh, late 1860s, our LDS missionaries uh, didn't, uh, didn't visit France or, um, or did some, uh, or, or, or do missionary work in France. Actually, in, 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 in the 19, 1860s, uh, LDS missionaries did missionary work in France. Uh, the, uh, the LDS church was established uh, around 1854 in France, in, um, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, France, uh, through a, a man called uh, Louis Bertrand, uh, who was a, a socialist and a Freemason and who uh, converted to the LDS church. Uh, but at the time, uh, our LDS missionaries didn't, um, I mean, I mean they, they, they couldn't do missionary work in France if they didn't speak French. Thank you, Crystal. Our, our next question comes from Dennis Young, and Dennis asks, did Thierry's children continue with church after his time working for the church? And did the youth camps help uh, people? Okay, so Thierry, uh, yes, Thierry did continue uh, with church uh, after his time uh, uh, with, uh, we, uh, as, as an employee. Uh, and also I, I can read the comment from uh, Charles Greenberg. Uh, who said that uh, Thierry was very dedicated. And, and this is something I, I saw from Thierry and I heard about Thierry. Thierry was very hardworking. He's a, he's a very hardworking man. Uh, and, uh, and Thierry, uh, I mean, you know, he, he began his ministry before he was even baptized. He, he began to organize church camps before he was uh, baptized by the church, before he was employed by the church. He was employed by the church in 2000, you know, because of um, Transformation 2000. And he was very dedicated as a, as a church uh, employee and he worked hard as a church employee. And uh, um, after his employment with the church, yes, he, uh, he continued his ministry, um, helping with the organization of camps, uh, um, organizing church, uh, church Sunday services, uh, at his uh, home in Brittany, uh, visiting uh, members in hospital or in, in, in various cities. So yes, Thierry was, uh, and still, I, I, I don't know, Joey, but he's, I think Thierry still is an active uh, minister and member of the uh, Community of Christ. He is, and in fact, Amélie, his wife, has now just recently accepted and been approved in her call to serve as an evangelist 
and she'll be the first woman evangelist called in France. Um, as Crystal mentioned, our, our last question is really a comment by Charles Greenberg, and I'll, I'll read that comment. Um, he says, Thierry and his son visited my wife and I in Lesker, France, near Pau, in the southern part of France, near the Pyrenees Mountains, um, over a thousand kilometers from Brest, where we lived during a long time, long term company assignment in 2003 through 2004. We also visited Thierry and Amelie and their family in Brest. I remember Thierry is very dedicated. In fact, he resigned his important position at the Brest Aquarium to become a transformation T2000 minister. We have wonderful memories of him and his family. And that's from Charles and Catherine Greenberg. And that's our, uh, our last question for today. Um, other than uh, Cristal, do you have any final thoughts before we end today's program? Um, no, I think, uh, no. Well, thank you so much. Thank once you for again. this opportunity to share, Barbara. Yeah, thank you, Cristal, for your time and for sharing with us about church history in France. And of course, lastly, we want to thank all of you, our friends in the audience, for your love of a good story and for generously supporting the Community of Christ historic sites with your donations. Thank you for your support. And I want to encourage you all to tune in again next week as we hear from Richard James, who will be speaking to us from Wales. Richard will present Community of Christ History in Wales, from the hell of the coal face and the iron and tin plate works to Zion. And just a reminder again, next week's lecture will also begin at 12 o'clock noon Central Time, 7 p.m. European Central Time. And Wendy has already dropped a link for the Church History Without Boundaries webpage in the chat. So be sure to follow that link to register for next week's program. So until next Thursday, take care, everyone. Keep reading your church history and have a great day. <laughs>